Hi, how are you doing? This is Craig Beck from StopDrinkingExpert.com and welcome in to today's episode. It may be a little bit short, this one, but it's really important. Now, the reason it might be a little bit short is because I've just moved home. I've got a new office, new studio. It's very nice but I have no idea if anything works or not. This is the first time I've turned the video camera on since we moved. Um, so what I wanna talk about today is because I'm, I'm getting a lot of emails about this at the moment, is alcohol in food. Should you be avoiding dishes that say they've got alcohol in them? Should you be panicking if somebody serves you a meal and then halfway through says to you, do you like the brandy sauce in there? I want to talk about that. Uh, and also the whole theater of going out for a meal, going to a restaurant, because when you're living an alcohol-free life, when you're living a sober life, it can feel a little bit like you're missing out on s something when you go out for a meal, because there's, there's always this big performance about the wine, isn't there? You know, the, pre the presentation of the wine list and choosing the wine to go with the food and you know, whatever you choose, the waiter will say, oh, good choice. <laughs> so it can feel a bit like you're missing out. I get it. And I want to tell you a little bit more about that and how you deal with it in a few moments time. Before we go any further, I just want to remind you that my quit drinking boot camp is on the road again. Now, last year I did nine or 10 boot camps all around the world, Australia, Canada, USA, UK, Dublin, all over the place. This year, I'm only doing four. That's all I've got space for in the diary. So if you've been thinking about coming to boot camp, do not put it off because the chances are these things are gonna sell out and then you will miss out on the opportunity and there will not be another opportunity for the rest of the year. If you wanna to come to boot camp and deal with your drinking in one amazing day, go to the website stopdrinkingexpert.com and reserve your place. Now. Alcohol in food. This, there's a really easy way to know whether you should avoid a meal or not. If you're trying to preserve your sobriety, if you're living an alcohol-free life, uh, basically it's this. If the food is hot, if the meal has been heated, is hot, then you're 90% good to go. I'm 90% certain that any alcohol in the food will have burned off during the cooking process, will have evaporated, and all you'll be left with is the essence of the original alcohol that was there. So if it's a brandy sauce, you'll get the taste of brandy, but there won't be any alcohol because it will have burned off in the cooking process. So that's for things that you see on the menu, like uh, coco van, you know, chicken in a, in a wine sauce, or a hamburger with Jack Daniels sauce, something like that. Uh, generally, 90% of the time, these sort of things are fine. Now, if the dish is cold, you're 90% better off staying away from it. And that's mainly desserts. Because actually, I've never heard of any cold meal that's had alcohol in it. I've never heard of a salad that comes with some sort of alcohol-based dressing. I'm sure they're out there, but I've, I've never seen any. But generally speaking, if the meal is cold and has never been heated, then you should stay away from it. So things like tiramisu. Tiramisu is delicious, it's awesome, but it has got alcohol in it and it's soaked into the sponge. Uh, trifle. Um, if you go around to my mum's house and she, she offers you some trifle, don't, because you, you won't pass a, a DUI. You won't, honestly, God knows how much alcohol she puts in her trifle. Um, these sort of things. So the desserts you should stay away from because they're, they're loaded with alcohol and it hasn't burnt off. Now, having said that, even if you do eat a piece of tiramisu, you're not really going to consume that much alcohol. It's just what the sponge at the bottom has soaked up. So it's not gonna get you drunk. It's not gonna put you over the limit or anything like that. The problem is it gives a little bit of food to the evil clown that lives in our head. You know, if you do my online course or you come to boot camp, I talk a lot about separating ourselves from the addiction. We are not the addiction. That little voice in our head that says, oh, I could do with a drink, or you deserve a drink, you've had a tough day, or whatever the excuse is that you hear in your head, that is not 
your voice. Even as though it sounds like your voice, it's not your voice. It is the voice of the addiction. It's what I call the evil clown. That's really important that you, you get that into your awareness because otherwise you can tend to think I'm broken, I'm weak, I'm pathetic, I'm selfish, I'm, and all these terrible labels that you give to yourself when you have a problem with alcohol. Because I know you're letting people down, you, you're not being there for your kids and your family and your friends because you're choosing alcohol before them a lot of the time. And in your sober moments, you're thinking, what a terrible person I am. What a horrible, weak-willed, pathetic person I am. And it's really important you understand that's not true. There's nothing wrong with you. It's just that you've got a very highly addictive drug inside your system, and it's pitched up a tent and it's not going anywhere. Now, I know that that can sound depressing, but it would be irresponsible of me to say to you, look, you, you, know, you do my course, you come to boot camp, and that's it, you're fixed for life. You'll never have a problem again. That's not true. You have this evil clown in your head, and he's going to be there forever. Now, what we can do is we can starve him of food, water, oxygen, and lock him in a tiny box, make him miserable until he falls into a very deep coma. And you can live the rest of your life with him in that coma if you choose. But if you have a dessert with a little tiny bit of alcohol in, it doesn't get you drunk, but what it does do is it wakes up the clown. And the clown is gonna start kicking you and trying to make you miserable because this is how all drugs work. They make you miserable while you have the knowledge that if you just take some more of the drug, you will escape misery and, and arrive at pleasure. So it's all carrot and stick. Gives you pain, relieves the pain, gives you pleasure, then takes away the pleasure and returns you to pain. And this is how the loop begins. Because you don't want to live in pain. And the drug knows this. So it offers you a solution and you take it. And then it removes the solution and gives you back the problem and it goes on and on and on. So it's really important that you avoid these cold dishes that have alcohol in them. If they're hot, try, try not to worry too much. So let's also talk about the, the whole theater of going out for a meal. Uh, and how do you do that? How do you enjoy a nice meal out at a fine restaurant if you're not drinking alcohol and everyone else around the table is? And I will admit and agree with you right here and now, unless you get your thinking straight on this, if you just walk into this environment cold, you're going to feel like you're depriving yourself. You're going to feel like the odd one out and you're going to feel like you're missing out on something special. And I've, I, you know, I tell this story, uh, this, uh, once I went to a bar with my friend and it was here in Cyprus in the summer where it gets to 45 degrees. I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit, probably 110, 120. Um, and we went into a bar together and we were so hot and tired and exhausted from being in the sun. And we went up to the bar and I ordered a Diet Coke. And my friend ordered a beer. And the waiter reached down into the freezer and he pulled out a frozen chalice. It wasn't a glass. This was like something you'd see on Game of Thrones. It was a, it was a goblet. It was a frozen glass goblet. And it was crackling because of the sun. And he took the frozen goblet and he went over to the beer dispenser. And it wasn't just a tap. It wasn't one of those soda siphon things. It looked like an aluminium swan's neck. And he filled this glass with this golden liquid. And as he did, the ice around the glass started to crackle and melt. And it was glistening in the sun. And he put it down on the bar top. And a choir of angels sang. Wah! Well, all right, they didn't, but that, this is kind of what it felt like. And he put it down on the glass, and I thought, I want that. Not, I want the beer. I want the theater. I want the majesty. I want the performance. Because then he brought my Diet Coke, and he took out a small glass from the shelf, not even cold. Took that squirty soda siphon thing and went, shh, and put it down in front of me. I felt ripped off. Why do they do this? 
And the answer is because people who drink Diet Coke in bars <laughs> will have one, maybe two, maybe three. They won't have ten and then start buying shots for everyone in the bar. They'll have a couple until they're not thirsty anymore, then they'll leave. They're of no value. Someone who comes in for a beer, there's a good chance, because of the way this drug works, if they're having one beer, they're going to have two. And if they have two, then they're going to have three. And so it goes. People drinking alcohol in bars are very good value customers. And like any business, we look after our good customers, don't we? We spoil them, we treat them well. And the same is going on in the restaurant. You know, if restaurants had to survive on what they made from the food, you know, 99% of restaurants would go bankrupt. They wouldn't be able to survive. They make their profit on the alcohol. And you know this. Because look at the wine list in a restaurant and compare it to what you're paying in the supermarket. And if you, sometimes you may even see the exact same bottle that you buy in the supermarket for $10. And here it is on a wine list for $50. Justify that. You can't. And here's how they get away with it. Because it's built into society. It's built into our collective awareness that you have wine when you go out for a meal. It's just what you do. And so most people, because they kind of like the drug, will pay the stupid price and buy into the performance. A because it facilitates their drug addiction, and B, because it is the social proof. It is what we are conditioned to expect. We know that when we, I don't know if this is true in the States, but in, in the UK, when you go to a motorway service station, a highway service station, and try and get some food, we, we know, A, the food's gonna be terrible, B, it's gonna be three times the price that we normally pay for it. Same thing in airports, isn't it? You buy, buy a sandwich in an airport, <laughs> you have to get a mortgage on your house. But we know it, and we do it anyway, because it is the social norm. Now, you have to understand this when you go into a restaurant as a sober person. You're not missing out on anything. You, you're just, they're not doing the performance for you. The illusion doesn't work on you. And that's a, actually a very good thing. Next time you go to a restaurant as a sober person, just watch the performance for what it is. Instead of sitting there thinking, oh, oh, I wish I could have some of that. Just watch the performance. It's insane. People behave different in restaurants than they do at home for no good reason. People at home will pour themselves a big glass of wine, sit on the sofa, and drink it. That's it. Then they'll fill it up again, and they'll drink it again. Nobody who consumes wine at home pours a glass of wine, goes like this. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, I like the way that swirls. Mm, oh, what a bouquet. I'm getting, I'm getting raspberries and chocolates. Yes, yes, it was probably 19, uh, 1999, maybe 2000. Nobody does this at home. Why? Because it's stupid, that's why. You're effectively swilling poison and seeing if it's good quality poison. But in restaurants they do. You see people swelling. <laughs> and the, the waiter pours a little glass for you first, a little, little sliver for you to try. And you try it. And you, and you give your assessment. Even though you haven't got the first clue what you're doing. And the waiter knows this, and you know this, everyone knows this. But it's this pantomime, it's this theatre performance that must happen. And you taste it and you go, yes, it's acceptable to me. Just about. It just about passes my filter. Carry on pouring. It's nonsense. It's nonsense. It's just garbage. It's all garbage. It's an illusion. It's sleight of hand. That's all it is. It's sleight of hand to distract you from the fact that you're paying 50, 60, 70 dollars for a bottle of cheap plunk from the supermarket that you could get from un under 10 dollars. You're being fooled. 
by an elaborate performance that means nothing. So next time you go out for a meal, just watch it. Just watch what's happening and laugh. Finally, I'd just like to say, look, don't, don't go for boring as your replacement. Don't think, because I'm not drinking, I'll just have the water. Why do that to yourself? Give yourself a treat. Find something exotic, something interesting. Find something on the mocktail list, something with no alcohol in it that you want. If they have some designer, you know, alcohol ginger, ginger beer, uh, alcohol-free ginger beer, I should say, or like a, a designer tonic water. You can get these tonic waters with elderflower in them, lemon and all these sorts of things now. They're a bit more expensive than normal, but hey, you're out at a restaurant, why not treat yourself? If you're going to a restaurant and you know them, and you really don't want to just stick with soda or water, take your own drink with you and give it to them behind the bar to serve you. Now, yes, you're going to have to pay a corkage fee. They're going to charge you for the right to drink your own drink in their premises, but that's all right, isn't it? It's certainly not going to be $70 a bottle. Even if it's, even if it's $10 a bottle, you're still in on the deal, aren't you? So I hope that helps. If you have any more questions about restaurants, food and alcohol and all that sort of stuff, drop me an email. Craig at craigbeck.com is the best one to get me on. If you are worried about your drinking and if you're thinking now is the time I want to take some action, because this is kind of strange time of year. A lot of people do dry January and then get to this point in the year and realize they couldn't do it on their own and they need some help. Well, go to my website, stopdrinkingexpert.com and join today's free webinar. And I'll give you a copy of my best-selling book, Alcohol Lied to Me, as a free gift just for making it to the end of the webinar. <laughs> I'm that boring. All right, thanks for watching, and I'll see you very soon. And it's the only drug on planet Earth that when you get a problem with it, they blame you and not the drug. That doesn't happen with any other substance. If you think about it, cigarettes, you tell someone you're addicted to cigarettes, they don't go, oh, you dirty smokeaholic. You're broken, weak-willed smokeaholic. You're going to be a smokeaholic for the rest of your life. They don't, they don't do that. They don't give you that label and say, well, that's it. You're broken forever now. I really consider this because it's different. It's, it's different to anything you can find out there, and it's, it gives you real mental freedom from the clutches of alcohol. I had an email about ooh, six months ago from a lady. She said, I was thinking about joining your course, but then I've just seen that red wine is good for your heart. How do you defend against that, Mr. Stop Drinking Expert? <laughs> yeah, it must be true. I said, well, the, the defense against it is not true. And that's the biggest defense you can always have.